All right, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our moderators for this evening. Um, on the far left, uh, the now dean of the Leeds School of Business, uh, a delight to have Sharon Matuzic co-moderating, along with, uh, on the far right, or I guess your left, is uh, the former dean of the law school and the executive director of Silicon Flatirons, Phil Weiser. Um, in the middle is our guest tonight, uh, Jim is originally from L.A. and came out to see you, uh, as he told me, uh, he looked out the, the window and said, for that, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and um, has crafted uh, a really fascinating career, and so this can be a ton of fun to hear about. Uh, in terms of before Lionsgate, among other roles, Jim was with Disney, um, and he joined Lionsgate seven years ago. Uh, during the past seven years, uh, annual revenues have moved from somewhere in the ballpark of 200 million to over a billion a year. Uh, he has a variety of roles, um, but the title is President of Worldwide TV and Digital Distribution. Please help me welcome back to see you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I get to start us off. You get to start, okay. And so I'm going to start at the beginning. So uh, when you were at CU, what were some of the important influences that put you on the path you're on now? Well, I think uh, there was a marketing class that I remember that was always a class that kind of opened my eyes to kind of how to sell various things and kind of how much was involved in marketing. You know, I, I kind of, when you get into college and you start to go to different classes, you, you, you think you know things. And I think my son who just started Wake Forest this week, he, he knows everything, <laughs> literally everything. I don't even think he needs to go. And, uh, and you get into classes and you hear things and you realize, wow, that's like an onion. That's just a little piece of the onion that got taken off. And, and wow, how much more is there? And I took uh, three or four classes. I started doing all the classes I could get. And I think that's where the love of uh, kind of just how to market things and how to position things, um, how much was involved. And even to this day, you know, one of my favorite parts of uh, my job is when I get to do the, the art meeting. And we look at different art and how do you position it for digital? How do you do DVD? How do you do theatrical? And what did you learn when something did or did not work? You know, when something didn't work, um, how do you change it? And so that, I really, it started at CU. That's terrific. And who were the important mentors or what were the most important events that really helped you develop as a leader? Well, I think um, I would say Rich Frank, who was my boss at Disney at the time. Uh, Rich was the chairman of the Walt Disney Studios. Uh, he, he really was a mentor, but he also taught me a lot about how to just, how to act in an environment where, especially the entertainment business is a business where you know, I was a young executive that was doing distribution, but I had to be, you know, I was dealing with people who were in their 50s and 60s and 70s in some situations. And uh, I had to learn how to, you know, kind of age up, if you will, and be able to talk to them in a way that made them comfortable. And that wasn't easy. And, and Rich Frank was always the, the person that, you know, I kind of watched how he would deal with talent, he would deal with executives, he'd deal with young people, old people. And he just had this way of flowing and he kind of adapted to everybody. And I realized, you know, that, that's just something that you need as you grow in, in, a, in any career, really. Uh, but especially in the entertainment business where there's so many different types of people. You get creative people to come in and business people. So I think that was, um, he was definitely one of the mentors at Disney that, that helped me. And I think the most uh, influential time for me was when I was working at MGM and Kirk Kerkorian sold the company to TPG and Providence. And actually, that's where I met David Bonderman, who's also been here to speak. And uh, I had a decision to make, which was to not be an operator. And I was, gonna, I was being hired by TPG and Providence hired me to be an overseer, basically an analytics overseer, where I wouldn't be in charge of an operation. And my entire career up to that point, I'd run groups. And I literally went home. And, and at the same time, Sony, who was taking over the distribution of MGM, Sony was trying to hire me to be an operator, but it was in a smaller role and I didn't really like it. And, I, and they put the hard press on me. I'll never forget the phone call I got from the executive at Sony. He called me and he said, Jim, you know, as you're deciding whether to go to TPG or stay with Sony, you, know, you just have to decide, do you want to be a quarterback or do you want to be an armchair quarterback? <laughs> and I remember going home, sitting with my wife going, God, I never thought about it that way. That's horrible. I, I, I don't consider myself that, but 
I, I looked at it and I literally said, TPG and Providence are probably two of the best companies in the business. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have to take a risk once in a while in your career. And I took the risk, and it helped me learn international. And, you know, sometimes one door opens another. And that became, you know, even though it was a, a stressful time for me, and I was out of the operation role for two years, and then I took over distribution MGM. But it, it was the best thing I could have ever done. So that was probably it. Was that after you were at Disney? Yes. So was Disney your first break into the industry? Disney was my first break. How did you, how'd that happen? Uh, I, I graduated here. I went back to L.A. I, I knew I wanted to get into the film business or the TV business some way. I called on every single person that I knew that could help me get into somewhere. I, I sent out my resume with a letter that was, uh, had a cover note, put my resume in there, and then I had my mom write in cursive on the bottom left, deliver by hand, personal and confidential. And I, I never put my name on the envelope because I knew that if I gave it to an assistant, they wouldn't open it. And it would get to the executive. And it worked really, really well. And I got, <laughs> I got, through, I got through to almost every executive to get an interview. And, and sure, you know, and today, you know, I, I actually did some of the deliveries, which you can't even do now. You can't even get in through the studios without getting through security. But ultimately, I met a guy, uh, Rich Goldman, who was trying to hire you know, Disney was exploding at the time. As you remember, Michael Eisner took over, and it was like a family-run business. None, none of the areas of the Walt Disney Company were really run at that time, uh, really with a long-term business eye, which is why they had all the shareholder issues, and Eisner came in and just brought a whole team in, and they were expanding as quickly as I've seen any company expand, and they, they had a job in, open in New York, and I really had no experience. I, didn't, I think I'd been there one time to, to visit. And they said, uh, you know, I went and interviewed. They liked me. They said, if you can be here on Monday, you got the job. So I, I went to New York, and that started the career. I was there 15 years. Wow. So as you think about your career, would you call yourself an entrepreneur? And what does that term mean to you? Uh, I would say that I'm more of an entrepreneur now than I was when I started. And I think it's a combination of love for being an entrepreneur and also necessity in the business. Um, when I started, I worked in the syndication business, which is a much more kind of structured business where you, you, know, you had, as I call it, a certain sandbox you had to live in. Um, and that sandbox, as cable became big and streaming service, you know, things changed in the business, the sandbox started kind of breaking apart. Yeah. And things changed and things were, you know, uh, very difficult to predict. You know, we used to look at a five-year horizon uh, and do five-year business plans. And then we started doing, well, that, you know, you can't predict five years. You know, then it started becoming do a rolling three-year plan as things started to change. Because you couldn't really predict four and year four right. and five with, you know, any kind of certainty. And now we're really on an annual plan. And even that changes in each quarter we look at things. And, you know, uh, I remember, you know, this gives you, you know, how, how you have to be an entrepreneur. I remember getting a phone call saying that Amazon Prime, which was in four countries, and they said, you know, we're going to keep expanding, and we're not sure when. And my team was dealing with that and, you know, dealing with the four or five countries that Amazon Prime was in, which is Amazon Prime is, you know, their streaming service. On it. How many here use it? Okay. Wow. You all know. <laughs> Great. And I got a phone call, and uh, it was the head of Amazon who I, who I work with, and he said, Jim, uh, we just turned on the globe yesterday. We turned every country on. And uh, we don't have it a lot, but we just decided to just go for it. And I was like, oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how many countries is that? 160 countries, whatever the number was. I said, OK. And I sat down and I said, OK, team. Brought my team in. I said, this is what we have to, we have to start thinking creatively. We have to start thinking out of the box. How do we address a company that's taken a streaming service from six countries to 160 overnight, and we didn't have time to plan. And were you in violation of your licensing agreements the minute they did that, because you didn't have rights for certain countries? No, I think we were in opportunistic mode. What can I give them in the other countries, and how quick can I do it? You know, and I think you get into the details, and I think the world is changing, where you know, because of technology now, you can open up a, basically a streaming service and in the globe, like Netflix has done. And it's really just about making sure that you're in the right position to take advantage of it, but you don't, like, you know, one of the things that happened early on to many companies, including my own, 
is uh, I remember when I started at Lionsgate, they, um, they had just finished a deal for Mad Men, the streaming rights to Mad Men in the US for Netflix. And they did a 15 year deal. And this is the part of the business that's just fascinating to me. When I heard the number, and I think it was reported, so I don't, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, but it was you know, around $800,000, $900,000 per, per episode. And you know, times 100 episodes, a lot of money. And it was a record at the time. But when you do anything for 15 years, you have risk. You have to prevent, you have to prevent things like Netflix going from 2 million subs to 50 million subs, and they still have the show. Right? Because you're still getting the same price as you did seven years ago. And so now I kind of, you know, that's where my entrepreneurial kind of spirit and brain power comes in because I always sit down and I say, okay, what's your schmuck insurance? Yeah. What, what, what do you got in the deal? How are you going to structure the deal so that I'm not going to get a bad call in seven years and say, why did you do that? Uh, Netflix just hit 100 million subs and I'm still making $2. So we spend a lot more time now really trying to figure out how to protect ourselves. So let me just walk through. You go to New York for Disney. You're there 15 years. They move you back out to L.A. during that 15-year time? New York, Chicago, and then L.A. And did you go from Disney to this MGM job? Was that the next step? Yes, that's, that's when I went to MGM. And how did that opportunity come about? It came about because I was friends with a guy named Jim Griffiths, and he was doing international, and he was doing cable. And I realized, because I was in that sandbox at Disney, and I think this is one of the career things I say to all my young people that come, come through now, uh, always be looking at the next wave of what your business is yeah. and try to be either whether it's reading or talking to people or, or doing things to, to understand what that next wave is going to be. And I knew at the time that international television distribution and digital was exploding. And, I and was, what year is this now? This was 85, this was probably 2000, right around 2000. And I was in the domestic syndication market and the domestic cable market. I had no international experience. And I didn't have a lot of basic cable or digital experience. And Jim Griffiths, who I knew, even though MGM was a smaller company and always rumored for sale, he said, Jim, I'm going to you know, get you experience in this and this and this if you'll leave Disney. Mm. And uh, it was a decision that I, I decided to do because I felt like I had to learn it. And I saw, I saw the business changing. With, you know, I look at the newspaper business, how that's changing. It's like if you could have learned how to monetize digital content earlier if you were in the newspaper business. Yeah. A lot of businesses, a lot of newspapers that would have yeah. been done would have been doing a lot better. Uh, the LA Times just made a change on their editor because they have not been ahead of the curve. Yet the Wall Street Journal and New York Times have done a pretty good job. You know, they have grown their, they yeah. figured out how to grow it. So that was really why I ultimately decided to go to MGM was just to learn something new even if it was risky. So in that sense, you were being an entrepreneur in yourself. Yes, that's right. And then from the MGM, is that where you went to go to back to Lionsgate? Yeah, so I was at MGM and then I worked for TPG and then we went through a bankruptcy which I learned more about your business than I ever <laughs> cared to want to learn. And quite frankly, I, I know a lot about restructured debt and uh, a lot of things that I didn't think I'd want to know. Uh, but the, and I, ironically, they've helped me in some situations. I, you know, I now will ask people if, if something's going you know, bankrupt or something has gone bankrupt, I say, can we go by the debt? You know, is there a way we go by the debt and come in through the back door, which is kind of uh, a unique way to, to buy a company these days. Uh, but I left because I didn't want to go through a whole other thing at MGM. And John Feldheimer at the time, who I was friendly with, he said, look, you know, our company's small. The stock was at $6. He said, but I want to create, and I think he had this kind of vision of trying to figure out the global world. I want to create a global distribution group so that no matter what happens, whether it's DVDs don't start selling, which they aren't. They aren't selling as much, or TV's growing, or streaming's going, or, or Apple blows it out, or whatever happens, we don't have any infighting. There's a captain of the ship that can say, you know, do more with Netflix, do a little less with Apple, do a little, you know, figure out that picture. A lot of the studios were stuck in silos where there was an international group, and there was a domestic group, and there was a digital group, and a, and a DVD group. And, and when people like Apple would get you know, into the business of streaming with Apple Music, you know, oh, you can't talk to them. That's not your department. You're not the streaming executive. You know, you're the, you're the, you're the TV executive. And so by having all of that under one roof, it, 
allowed us to really look and kind of change what our distribution patterns have been many, many times. And then I think about a year after I, I joined, uh, then we had a little movie called Hunger Games. And that, that changed everything for us. And then the whole company has kind of transformed and the most recent thing we did was just by stars. So that's now a Lionsgate company based you know, in Denver and in LA. I worked out of the stars office this week. And so that's, that's kind of the next evolution for us, which is to, you know, we're, we're all about content and we're all about what we do with that content. And I think if you look at Stars, I think we looked at it as, you know, HBO already had their Game of Thrones. Stars doesn't have their Game of Thrones. So you'd rather buy mm. Stars before they get it than after. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a if there's a dynamic, it's and, and I think we're good at content. Uh, we hope to find our Game of Thrones. So as you grow and expand into different markets and get much larger in size, how do you keep the organization entrepreneurial? Oh, that's a, that's a good I don't know. Uh, I constantly move people around into different jobs, mm. and I force them to be uncomfortable a bit. I think that helps. You know, I don't like take an international person and you know put them into the DVD business or a DVD business and throw them into streaming. But I will give people. You know, you're doing uh, digital distribution in Asia. Uh, you just got Europe. Okay, you're going to work with the European team and learn that. Mm. I think if you start to get people to understand other parts of the businesses and other parts of our business, uh, it just opens their eyes. It just opens their eyes. And I, I always encourage people to take a risk, and if it doesn't work out, just move on. Don't linger. And um, we've made lots and lots of mistakes over the years, and we've had, a, you know, obviously we make less mistakes than, 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 the others. than others. <laughs> so that, that's what you, you strive for. But if you're not taking a risk, you're not going to get anywhere, especially today, mm -hmm. especially today. So um, let's talk about how you think about decision making, because you said you picked the Hunger Games, so maybe talk about it. I didn't pick it. You didn't? All right. No. I was a recipient of a lot right. of value of that, but I, <laughs> I didn't so, pick it. So what, what did you pick that you were involved in that you think this was a decision we made really well, this worked out really well? And then which one that you look back and you're like, wow, we blew it there? Um, I think one of the first decisions I made uh, when I was at MGM and the digital business was changing was to um, get aggressive and get on the Apple platform early. And I, I think I, I probably, that the first company that made a deal with Apple to sell movies was Fox. That was the first deal. And if you read his book, mm. he talks about Jim Giannopoulos, and, and, uh, who's an executive at Fox, and how difficult it was for Steve Jobs to get him to agree to sell movies. You know, people were worried about piracy. They were worried about a whole bunch of things. Uh, and in that particular situation, I knew that if I was early before the big elephant studios, which were kind of slow and a little bit lumbering, I knew I'd, I knew I'd be able to do more business than maybe they would. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up being the second studio in Apple, and I didn't have a lot of really great films, but I had The Princess Bride. Has anybody seen The Princess Bride? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did you have James Bond, too? Yeah, we did, but we yeah. didn't put it up because the, the, the Broccoli's didn't want it up. They were nervous. It's new. Mm. This could be piracy. I'm not sure. So we put up the rest of our library, and I remember The Princess Bride went to number one on Apple. And I took a picture. I said, okay, someday I'm going to look at this and say, you know, who knew that an old movie like that would go to number one on Apple? And partly it was just due to the fact that not all the, not all the other studios were on the platform yet. And so sometimes it's, it's good to get on there quick. Uh, I did that um, with Comcast when they started selling movies. And we, we had a deal with them that said there had to be two other studios in order for, for us to be on the platform with them. And they couldn't get their deal done on the weekend. And this is what I love about my boss uh, is I called John Feltheimer and I said to him, I said, John, you know, we have a deal in place. I had the schmuck insurance, which means we need three studios for them to start selling movies on Monday. This was on a Friday. We want to start selling on Monday, and they had three deals they were going to do, and one of the deals imploded. So I got a call from, you know, my contact, and he said, Jim, I need a favor. Would you waive that clause, and will you launch with me on Monday? And if I had gotten that call at Disney, it would have been 47 meetings over mm -hmm. the weekend. Or it would have been mm -hmm. emails, and everybody go, oh, my God, what are the ramifications? I got on the phone with John, and he says, 
what do you want to do? I said, you know, I think we should go for it. I think these guys are, you know, are going to be big, and Comcast is going to be a real player in the digital movie sale business. And I think we should go for it, John. He said, okay, do it. And it was the extent of the goal. I mean, there was not big strap planning. There wasn't a lot of, you know, have 14 other people weigh in. And we ended up uh, with Comcast becoming our number two retailer. They overtook Amazon. Which is kind of amazing. It also shows you the benefit now, and I think this is one of the things that's changing. When you have a captive customer, like Comcast does when you're turning on your television, if you can just offer something up like buying a movie early, easily, you can make that you know $100 million business overnight if you just do it and you're smart and you take advantage of that real estate. I think it's one of the reasons why you know Amazon did a great job in saying, look, we're, we have all these people in Prime, Let's just start licensing content, making content, and just make it available to them, the same, the same audience. I have this captive audience, and, and let's then start to build it. Uh, it's the same thing that Netflix did when they came in. And I, I'll never, I saved this presentation, you'll love this. When Netflix first came in, all they were doing is delivering DVDs by mail, and, and that's all they did. And they came in and they were starting in the streaming business. I was at MGM, and they had a presentation of, we want to buy everything you can't sell. And to a distribution executive, that's like music. <laughs> like music to yours, you're like, everything I can't sell? He said, we only want to buy things that you can't sell. Incremental, added value. What's an example of that? An old black and white TV show like um, Outer Limits. You know, not a big thing. Or we had Sea Hunt at the time. You know, we want to buy Sea Hunt. We want to buy this. We want to buy it all. They just literally, they wanted to buy bulk. And we looked at them and we said, okay, what is this going to bring? What is this going to do? Do we want the short money? Do you want to take the short money? And, you know, I, 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 will, I was one of the executives. All of Hollywood took the short money. We all gave them our content. At the time, it was the bottom of the catalog. All of you started watching it and didn't have to pay another dollar. You know, they literally called up and said, hey, guess what? You get a, you know, you get a benefit today. We get a little streaming service. And cut to today, they have 50 million subs and they they're gonna probably at some point shut down the DVD business. And that's a great example of, of really transitioning a business and really you know, taking it to the next I mean, level. it's extraordinary because they didn't get cannibalized. They cannibalized Blockbuster by doing DVDs through the mail. Mm -hmm. yep. Blockbuster's out of business. It could have been somebody else who cannibalized them with the streaming service. They cannibalized themselves and managed to survive that transition. Yeah, that's right. And what's remarkable to me about your story is how many different business model transformations have taken place in your industry. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you've been able to stay ahead of that. Can you talk a little bit about that process and how you think you were able to see these changes and act on them in a way that others didn't? Well, I, th I think everybody saw them. I think if you look at all the studios, they, took, they would take that risk at different times. You know. Um, I, I have kind of a bifurcated philosophy, which is in certain situations, I want to be first. You know, if I feel like it's a risk worth taking, I'll take that risk. I get good data. I learn about it. Um, I've had a couple things that have imploded. You were asking one that imploded. We, we launched with Vimeo globally for TV. Vimeo is a pretty big service for, you know, people. And we, we did this big launch, and we launched for global TV, and it was great. But nobody's buying TV and Vimeo, so that didn't work. You know, but, but I still would look back and take that chance. Um, you know, and I think that um, you have to take those chances, and if you do, you'll, you'll learn quicker, and you'll be more comfortable taking that next risk. You know, and that, I think that's it. Once you get comfortable taking risks, then you, you just gotta, you just don't fall off the edge too much. Mm -hmm. you know, just get up to the edge and take the risk. And um, I, I think the, one of the more enjoyable ones I did was I was able to get the Broccoli's who make and manage the Bond franchise. Apple at the time, and you're going to see Apple's coming out in a week or two, and they're doing their big, you know, big announcement. Whenever they do their big announcement, um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes in Hollywood. It was actually written about, you may have, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that they're having conversations with all the major studios now about doing 4K on Apple devices, which, you know, I think everybody can speculate. You're going to get a 4K phone. You're going to get a 4K TV, you know, Apple TV. And so they're talking to all of us about trying to transform the business. And when they do that, there's that moment when you can take advantage of something. And, and when they went to HD, which was a big leap, I went to the Broccoli's 
and I went to Apple, and I said, Apple, if, if you cut the right deal with me, how would you like to launch HD on the back of the 20 Bond movies? We up res all of them to HD, and all of a sudden used Bond as a great example of the, the promise of HD. And I was going to one of the more conservative companies, and uh, when I went to the Broccoli's, I said, you know, Barbara Broccoli and I had a meeting, and she goes, I, I don't know, I don't even know if the money's worth it. And I had a certain amount of money involved, and I, it was a lot of money. It was really worth it. And, <laughs> um, and, and so I wanted to do everything I could to convince her. And I did something I, I normally don't do, which is I took out a pirate site. And I said, here's why you need to do this. Because they're already pirating you off of Blu-rays. They're already taking the Blu-ray discs. Let's give them a legitimate way to buy this. Let's take the money now and give them a legitimate way. Let's not let the pirates eat our lunch. And sure enough, it worked. And she agreed. And Apple agreed to the right deal. And we were the first to launch on that. So that, to me, is you know, the kind of example that you, know, you could look at that and say, why would you put the company at risk for the piracy risk of being the first mm -hmm. in HD? Or you could look at it as be a little bit of a pioneer and see if you can you know, ride that wave. So what did you learn over your career that you would tell a younger version of yourself? Oh my God, I didn't see that question. <laughs> I didn't, these are like the secret questions. That I, I don't know. Uh, well, you know what, I would, I would say this. Uh, I don't think you can get away with three companies in your career anymore. Mm. I, I just don't think the business allows it. I've been at Disney, I've been at MGM, I've been at Lionsgate. I will probably finish up at Lionsgate. I mean, you never know, but... You know, that'll be a long, fruitful, really successful, fun career. Three places. And they've changed, and my jobs have changed, so I've you know, been intellectually stimulated, worked out great. But companies are under a lot of pressure. It's hard to give raises. I mean, I look back on my early raises at Disney, and they were pretty good raises. I mean, we don't give raises like that anymore. I mean, it's just not the same. And so I think that, you know, and, and it's... One of the things I hate, and it happens to me all the time, is I get poached. And I have great executives that you know, are young and coming up in their career. And you know, they come in, and all of a sudden, uh, Microsoft just offered double the salary. I just lost somebody to Netflix two weeks ago. I, you know, I've been losing people right and left. And it's frustrating to me. But I also have to look at it as a young person coming up, somebody that's coming up in their career. If I can't double your salary, you know, sorry, you know, I, I got to move on. And there's so many great tools. You know, my tools at the time were, hey, I got to have lunch with so-and-so to let them know I'm interested in a job. Now you can go online and there's so many great tools you can use to find that next career, to, to network a bit. I, I, I even, I, we've, been using, we've been using LinkedIn a lot as a tool. It's a really great tool. And, and ironically, when I lose somebody, I go right to LinkedIn. Find me somebody that can do exactly what this is and kind of that might want to come work at Alliancegate. So I think that would be it. Keep your eyes open. Don't, don't jump too fast, because when I see a resume and I see five jobs in five years, uh, you've you got a really difficult road for me. But if I see two years here and three and one, you know, and, I, and, and they can explain it, uh, it's actually really kind of enlightening. And it's also, I think, empowering to people now to, to not stay in a job too long. So we've got a lot of lawyers and soon to be lawyers in the room. This industry has a lot of legal issues. Let me take you through a couple. First off, you've got a major star in what you think could be a, a multi, you know, um, show series, multi-season, or a movie with sequels. How do you create a structure that you protect yourself and that you don't end up with a star who turns around and says, okay, now it's a hit. I want you to give me half the profits. <laughs> uh, you can try. You can try all day. You can have the best contract you've ever, you can do your best work and it just may not work. If it's Jennifer Lawrence, it just may not work, you know? And, and I think you see it a lot in TV shows. What happens is they see how much money the studios are making and they realize, and you know, what they don't, you know, what you don't remember is we took a risk on it to begin with. One of the reasons you take a risk on a TV show or you take a risk on a, on a movie is that you, hope it works, you, you put all this time and effort resource behind it, and then the fruits of your labor are, are hopefully gonna be something that will pay off. 
Um, we also have a lot of movies that don't work. So, you know, I, I always say, well, can you go back when our movie failed? Can you go back and ask one of those actors for some of the money back? When they don't give us a good, you know. Right. No, it's, I, I acted, I got my money, and no, you can't do that. So there's really not much you can do. I think that's where the relationship part of the business comes in. And uh, our GC, Wayne Levin, is, is amazing. And he deals with, you know, and, and I think this is one of the things I would, I would tout a career in entertainment. Uh, not to say it's better than anything else, but it's a really interesting career in law because you have the law and you have your contracts and we go through all of that and then you have your dynamics. And I spend most of my time with Wayne talking about dynamics. Can you go and sue this person? And Wayne and I will have a conversation. It's gonna get out, how will it look to the other actors? How will it look to the other talent? How will it look to a producer? Um, when we have settlement conversations, uh, we have a lot of conversations where we sit down and we say, okay, we have a snit, we have a problem, they've audited us, something's gone on, and we have to make a decision about settling. Uh, that is a fascinating part of, of the kind of the collision between your experience and my experience, and we, we talk about that all the time, and, and sometimes we, we go to arbitration and we'll gamble Sometimes we'll settle because we just don't want to have an issue. And that part keeps it intellectually stimulating, but it's far from black and white. So one more legal question then. Getting clearances for copyrighted works. I've heard horror stories of in a movie, you've got one shot with a TV poster, and you're like, how do we handle this? Because getting the clearance for this is going to be a nightmare. You know, do you pull the fair use card? Right, that's one of the options. One of the options, but you can't do too much of that in the movie. I, I think that's, it's a really tough thing to do as a studio. It's not as tough to do if you're an independent producer, you know? And it's, um, and once you kind of open the door yep. of licensing a clip, your fair use arguments go right out the window. Right. So th there's a balance on that that we do. Um, I also invest in documentaries and I've made a couple documentaries and the Jim Packer investor yeah. doesn't like that risk because it's a small movie and you could get in trouble and, and so you, you try to license. Um, the, the other way to go is, is figuring out creative ways to slice up the rice. You talk about how, we, you know, how we've changed our, mm. our thinking. Um, now we'll go in and when we license a clip, we'll say we want theatrical, we want SVOD, but we don't need DVD anymore. And that was most of your business before, so we need that to be less money. Oh, wait, 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 what do you mean? Well, we're just going to exclude DVD from this license. And they hate it because we can now bifurcate a bit and really get more granular about how we do our licenses mm. so that we're more strategic. Um, and I think that's because there's been so many different rights uh, that have been created, that gives us another tool, you know, that we can uh, take advantage of that tool. Well, maybe, Shannon, one more question before we go to the audience. Um, what's your favorite movie? <laughs> My favorite movie. Uh, I, I would have to say I love Shawshank Redemption. If I'm alone and that thing's on TV, I stop. I don't know why, but I always stop. I'll watch the commercials. I'll watch the movie. I'll stay up too late and I'll get mad at myself. I, it's the 18th time. You know? <laughs> I don't need that. So I, 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 I always, that's one I, I love watching. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the second Hunger Games. Um, catching Fire, and I liked it because for me personally, it was a point in my life where I was at this new company, and the first movie was done, but I knew that behind the scenes, we didn't spend as much money, because you know, this was a big movie for us. And if you're a movie aficionado, there's certain scenes where you go, God, you know, if we had the money, mm. this would have been, you know, God, even better. And we spent the money on the second one. So the vision of what you could do with that book kind of came to life. In, in a much bigger way, and if you, you watch those movies back to back, you can really notice it. So that's, I would say, you know, uh, just from a personal standpoint, another movie that I, I, I truly love. So one of our Silicon Firearms rules is the students get the first couple questions. And of course, as a professor, I'm not afraid to call on people, so. <laughs> yes, Courtney. I'll repeat the question. 
whether it's technological, legal, social, or something else, what about the job or your industry scares you the most? Mm. There's a lot of things that scare me, to be honest. I mean, I, I wouldn't say scared. I, I would use the word I'm keeping my eye on. You know, like I, I keep a, a little bit, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think about it. Netflix is growing at a pace that nothing has ever been in our business that's been similar to that. So the growth spurt, the way they went into international, you know, we do business with them, we license to them, we make Orange is the New Black for them. Um, we're in business with them nine ways from Sunday, every single way you can look at it. When you do a deal with Netflix, you have to make that decision. Are you better off? Because, you know, they take global rights now. So you have to make that decision of, do I take the money, and if, an, if Apple gets into the streaming business, did I make a mistake? You know, what is that going to look like if I take $5 million for something with Netflix because they're the, kind of the only buyer, and a month later, Amazon, uh, you know, uh, Apple gets in the business, and uh, I'll pay you 20 for that, Jim. Is that available? No, it's not, not available. It's gone. You know, and so I think that... that you keep the DVD rights when you do the Orange is the New Black? Yeah, we, do, we keep DVD and we keep some TV rights and we keep some digital rights, but now when you sell a show to, to Netflix, you don't get to keep that. Mm -hmm. So we don't produce that much for Netflix anymore, par partly due to the fact that we are gambling on ourselves and we're gambling that, you know, licensing something, and, you know, making a TV show or making a movie for Netflix and having it go away for 20 years and not having any ancillary benefit isn't a good bet. It's not a good bet with the world changing. So it's really making... I think the thing that keeps him is what bets do you make? And that's kind of what, I, I, I still love that, even though it's a little stressful. All right, one more student question. Yep, in the back. How's it going there? I'm a current 1L. Um, my question is, it's not exactly your industry, but it's auxiliary to your industry. It's net neutrality. Um, of course, you have licensing that will be affected by that. So how do you feel like, the technological policy, if neutrality goes away, how will that affect your business, and how do you think we should approach it? Well, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of Lionsgate here. I'm speaking J Jim Packer, Inc., which is a business of one right here. Uh, I, I, I don't really want to throttle the net at all. I think that you, it is such a critical part of all of our lives, all these different things. I think, you know, technology isn't easy to throttle either. You know, if you, the minute you start doing that and, you know, it's your own photos or your own things with your family. You know, I just think there's a lot of risk if we don't keep that completely free and clear and let everybody truly take advantage of that. And, and so I'm a big believer in net neutrality, even though when I call on Comcast and some of my others, they, they would like to charge for it, and I do get that. Uh, but I'm just a, I'm a believer in really keeping that simple. Great. All right. Uh, we have a microphone here, so we'll... Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a Scripps Journalism Fellow here at CU. And uh, during my career as a TV investigative reporter, the most common question I got asked is, where do you get your ideas? My answer was always the same, everywhere and from anyone. So I'm going to turn that around on you, Jim, and ask you, for all the people here, including me, who have a TV series pitch we want to make, what's the best contact information to send that to Lionsgate? <laughs> <laughs> who do we contact? Yeah, I'll, I'll get you the name. There's a whole department that takes all those pitches and loves them. Beautiful. Okay. I put my card on your desk. Oh, good. I saw that. Good. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Great presentation. My question is that years ago, when we really had three major networks, the quality of production was extremely, I, I don't want to say poor, I'll just say very elementary. Uh, with the rise of many cable channels and now all the different uh, companies, the production quality has gone way up. Even a weekly television show is almost like a movie today, and the writing has also gotten better, and yet the market has been cut into so many small pieces where there used to just be three networks. How does this work out? Why is this happening that we're able to support such an exploding uh, entertainment industry even though there's uh, much smaller pieces of the pie? Well, it, it's a... 
really interesting question, and it's, it, it is an exploding content landscape right now, more so than I've ever seen in my career. I think it's something, yeah. we, had a, we had our MBA interns in this summer, and I think it's like 360 shows were produced this year. Okay? No one can watch 360 shows no matter how much binging you're doing. Okay? So you can't do it. So it, one of the things that's gone on is they've scaled the license fee per hour or half hour of shows. So when you're watching the Sundance channel, the budgets are 250 to 5. When you're watching Netflix, the budgets can go up to 10. Um, and everybody's found their budget range. That's the first thing that's going on. So it's not all at the same quality level. So you can do more volume that way. Uh, just from a manufacturing standpoint, because we are a manufacturing business. I mean, although it's much more eloquent than that, but it is. We've had a lot of film people shift over. The only reason that we're able to, as, a, as an industry, make that many television shows is that we have so many film people that have come in and gotten involved. Behind the camera, writers, you know, actors. I mean, I don't think there's an actor now that won't, you know, they, they used to not do TV. You know, they'd stay with film, and I'm not doing TV. Now their agents are like, I got TV, we're doing TV. What you was know? the turning point on that? When did it become, because I think mm -hmm. we are living in a golden age of TV. The quality and quantity of TV shows is extraordinary. When did that begin to shift? I think with the, I, I think there were two shifts. One, when basic cable started getting into the high-end scripted business. When, when FX went from just buying movies and reruns to producing things like Fargo, producing things that were high quality, uh, that ecosystem of 50 networks all had to compete. So that was a huge, you know, explosion of content. And then the second thing was the, the, the rise of the streamers, you know, and, and their, their ability to, you know, we went in with, with Orange is the New Black with Genji Cohen, and we were the second big show to sell to Netflix. And it was a, at a budget level, to your point about quality, it was at a budget level that they'd never bought before. We didn't even think of them as a buyer in this range per episode. But they said, done, do it, make the show. And so all of a sudden, you know, the market has come to basically risen to meet that demand. Now, what you're going to see, though, is I don't think it can be sustainable. I don't think you can sustain that much. So I think you're, you're going to see, you've already started to see the bubble. I don't know if anybody's been reading, but a lot of cable networks are just going black. Mm. They're just shutting off. Mm. So, you know, Universal just announced two or three networks. So all of a sudden, you know, you had a network like Clue, which was in 40 million homes. It goes away. And so you're starting to see the pairing of those networks that ultimately start to bring down the volume of content. And then it will be, you know, which is one of the theses for our company, we don't, we're, we're, we're a benevolent arms dealer. We don't really care where we go. We'll sell our con we'll make content, movies, TV shows for anyone. Um, we don't have to make them just for stars. We're making, we're going to be making one for other, you know, pay TV networks. So we truly believe that as a content um, expert in the production and distribution of content, that even if it goes down to 250, those of us that have that experience are going to, they're going to come to us because quality will matter even more. That's going to take some discipline now that you're vertically integrated with stars. If the best place for a show is Netflix or is an over the top and not stars, how are you going to make sure that you make that in the merits and it's not like our, your stars, you know, colleagues are saying, oh, come on, we want it. I can't answer that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I really like how forward his uh, question was, um, but kind of to build on that, what's um, what is a typical like? What's a very good pitch pack look like for you when someone is presenting their film? Like what? Like is there a lookbook, uh, the script? Well, I mean, it, we we do we have so much content coming through our company that you know we do twenty theatrical movies a year, and we probably make ten to fifteen of those, and those come in through that theatrical distribution or theatrical production group the motion picture group. And that can be everything from a script to a package to, um, you know, like, in a, and, and it, it takes different things. Like John Wick, as an example, came in as a finished film. And again, that John Wick was a great example of something comes in the door. Everybody had passed. We saw it. I remember sitting in the screening with, you know, our, our group, and we watched it. And everybody was scared of spending $30 million in P you know, advertising to market the movie with Keanu Reeves, who was kind of like kind of not done at that point. Yeah, it was kind of done. And they gave it to us in August, and, and this is where Lionsgate's great. We said, we'll take it, and we'll put it out in October. Wow. Done. And then How much money did it make? A lot. 
a lot. But ironically, the second one, we then made the second one. So the first one we bought, and then we worked our, redid our rice. So now that's a Lionsgate owned production. It's actually Summit production. And um, so it takes different ways. And Keanu Reeves, at that point, only was contracted to the first one. Yeah, but we had enough money to pay him for the second. <laughs> we, were, we were okay. And the second one actually, it was actually a rare phenomenon. This is, you love when you get surprised. And John Wick, of all things, surprised us. Why? Because everybody's been reading about how it's called sequel attrition. Yeah. You no know sequel does as well as the first movie. They just don't. It's a good trivia question. There are a few that have done better, but very few. Yeah, and John Wick 2 was one of those now. Was it a better movie? It was a better movie, but it was also, uh, it was, he became a cult hero, partly due to ancillary DVD and digital distribution. It was a huge title for me on Apple mm -hmm. and DVD. It was a huge title on DVD, and people watched it, and they rented it, and, and they realized, wow, this is kind of interesting. I, I, you know, and, and then when the second one came out, they said, I'm going to go to the second one. So we, I think we doubled our box office which is just wow. a rare moment, but it does show you the benefit of getting your content and all those forms of distribution so that people can become a fan. And, and that, that's how it happens. Let's go right back there, Julian. This is a great talk, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, so where does distribution go from here? And who gets disintermediated? Right, so and I know you can make a lot, I hope it's, a it's lot of money. money. <laughs> if you make, if you have, I hope it's like in no, five years. It's, it's fascinating, right? The rise of Amazon, the rise of Netflix. These are all very powerful entities. As is Apple. What, how does this play out in your mind? How how does content distribution truly play out in the end? And again, it's a, it's a question you can't actually answer. Yeah, I, well, but but it's interesting because did anybody see the movie? Uh, was it Logan's Run? Just came out, right? With Logan's uh, Run, Sodenberg, Logan yeah. something, Logan, Logan, Logan Lucky, Logan, Logan Lucky. So, does anybody know the dynamic with that? He, Steven Sodenberg, chose the non-studio route. Don't like Hollywood accounting. Don't know what you guys bring to the table. They, he did it all on his own. And we came out head to head with him with Hitman's Bodyguard, with Sam Jackson and uh, Ryan Reynolds, and. You could look at that, and, and if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, Logan Lucky is like 80, and Hitman's Bodyguard's like 30. So you'd think that the better movie, you know, going out in theaters, doing it on your own, might do better than the studio-produced popcorn action summer flick. But it flipped. Mm -hmm. And why? Because I do think, you know, Julian, to your point, we add a lot of value. We, we do 40 movies a year. So, you know, what the poster looks like and where you put your ads and how you do it and what data you use. Um, you know, Manchester by the Sea, we did. Even though it was an Amazon movie, we distributed that theatrically and, and they came to us to do that because we have that expertise. So I, I guess the hope is that if we continue to be ahead of the curve and be on the cutting edge of doing that, that we'll either get talent or packages that we can get that will, will get us the right product, or people will be attracted to the, to the right distribution partner. Hi, I'm Mary Catherine. So my question for you is actually not more forward thinking, but more in retrospect. Um, you mentioned that the guy that pulled you to MGM when he was speaking with you mentioned, you know, oh, we, we're going to teach you or, you know, you're going to learn about this, this, and this. Was that something that when you were kind of looking to make a change in your career or even not necessarily making a change, um, were you forward or open with people about what you were thinking that you might be interested in doing in the future or things that you kind of wanted to start dabbling in as you like look towards progressing your own career? Yes. I was at Disney and I was frustrated. I was ready. I knew I was ready for the next challenge and I went to the company and I said I want to mm. do this and I'd like mention in this and I mentioned that. No, 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 no. It's not you stay in your stay in your sandbox. And I think that it was one of the catalysts for me to say, you know, it's time to take a risk and go and go to MGM because I knew uh, if I didn't leave then, and that was after 15 years, that was actually a pretty long run, and I knew if I didn't take that chance that I wouldn't, wouldn't get that opportunity. And, but I, I think it's, to your point, it's also one of the things I'm trying not to do to my employees. So I, we bring them in, we ask, if we can give them growth, I have two executives right now, younger executives, that one wants to move to Hong Kong, and HR came and said no. 
we're not going to let you move that executive to Hong Kong. And I said, you know, I, I don't agree. I'm going to move. I want to move this. He, he's, they're so hungry. I'll keep them for a year or two. They're going to be motivated to be successful. Um, is there any legal reason or any other thing? You know, what? what why can't I? <laughs> and ultimately, I think we're going to make that move. And I think it's because you have to, if you're a company today, with young, you know, with people of all different ages coming up through the career ranks, if you can give people career growth, you need to do it. You just need to do it, or you lose people. All right, we have time for two more questions. Three more questions. One, two, and then three. Hi, my name is Chris Dierorf, uh, Leeds undergrad and MBA uh, grad. Uh, so I run a storytelling marketing company, and just a real simple question for you. What, what do you think makes a great story? Well, today, I would say what makes a great story is something that you think could navigate the clutter of 300 TV shows. That's, I, I literally look at things and say to myself, you know, what is out there? And you know, the competitive landscape with three networks is just different than when you have all these networks competing. So you, you know, a, a little bit of a little knockoff of a story, like, hey, it's similar to this, but it has a woman in the lead. Doesn't work anymore. You know, it just doesn't. You, you really have to have something that's, that's fairly well done. Um, so I think that's one of the areas that we look at, and we really we, we, we try to, to do everything we can to break out. Um, and oh, let me see something else that I would say we would look at. We also look at where there's underserved audiences. You know, Stars has done a great job. Chris Albrecht's done a great job with power because, you know, it, it's. 60% African American, 60% black, and 40% non. And you, you, know, you look at that TV show, and it's serving. It's a pay TV show with pay TV sensibilities. And there's no reason that somebody shouldn't be making that show. And it is the number one successful show on Stars, And it was so successful. And that audience is an audience that everybody wants in, in, in their tent. So my team licensed it to Hulu. So Power's now on Hulu, and it's getting new. It, what we're finding is it, it, Power on Hulu now, people are just kind of stumbling in, and they're getting hooked, and then you lose them for, for six seasons. You know, you lose them for every season. They, they're going to watch everyone. So, you know, that, which is good. You know, we, they, they just immerse themselves in that, in that show. Kind of like the John Wick thing, yeah. the second movie. And I think that's where technology has helped us. If you have the right product, people can discover things easier. Uh, Andrew Manley, I'm a third year law student here. Um, my question is, we've heard a lot about the changing distribution methods, but I'm wondering more about uh, maybe the untapped international markets for content. And we have a number of examples of movies that are, by all accounts, flops here in the United States, but go on to make lots of money internationally. And so I'm wondering how does uh, expected international performance kind of play into your decision making when it comes to what types of content to put out and then what do you think is going to be the next um, I guess big consumer of content outside of the U outside of the US and China I, you threw China in there that would, have, that would have been an easy answer for me <laughs> uh, <laughs> make it a tough you know these studio Make it a tough. Exactly. exactly. Um, I would say international factors in more and more depending on the type of movie. So if you have films that hit particular genres, it, you know, it used to be kind of on average 40, 50% of what you could expect from a revenue potential. It can be up to 60, 70, 80 now, depending on the film. And then some films that you could have licensed into that market, urban films, as an example, are much harder. They're really, really hard. But, but the markets are also changing, and I think the world's opening up a bit. So, you know, some of the urban, like we, we do a lot of, uh, you know, urban product through Code Black, which is a label that we own, and we did a movie called All Eyes on Me. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was a, you know, a, a, a biopic. And that went out in the UK and made two million pounds. Did really, really well. It was a, a very successful release there. So that's an example of a market changing where we wouldn't have expected 
to get much on, on that kind of a movie uh, out of the UK, but people are open to, you know, to your point, a good story. It was a great story. People went, they paid the money, went to the theater. So I think, you know, we don't know where the next big revenue stream is going to come from. I couldn't have predicted Netflix would be my biggest licensing client when they came in and said, we want to buy everything out of your library that you can't sell. I just, we couldn't have predicted. So I, I think that we look at this uh, business now a bit more opportunistic. And when you see something open up, you have to go out and, and really attack. And, and I think international is a place where we'll, we will find more surprises internationally than we will domestically. And this is a big culture challenge because you were able to adapt this back to being an entrepreneur. In a lot of industries, people say, we keep doing things the way we've always done them. And somehow that was never your MO. No, and I don't think it's been our business. I, I learned a lot from the music business. Just I watched, that happened. Yeah. That whole situation happened early. And I read about this stuff all the time. And, and I followed that carefully because I was scared to death that you know what basically tanked the, mu the mu music business early on was going to come you know, and, and it was going to affect my business in a really negative way. And so we really watched that. And you know, they waited so long before they started, you know, they waited too long to license music. They should have, you know, and so the one thing I think we've learned is watch other businesses that have something similar and either it's a success or they make some mistakes, try to take away some learnings. So let me ask what's going to be my last question, which is on the same point. Newspapers had a golden age in the 70s and 80s. The quality and quantity in journalism right now uh, has clearly gone down from where it was 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. TV has gone up in quantity and quality. How do you explain that difference? And is there a hope for newspapers, like you're saying with you know, music, of getting its mojo back? I, it's a good question. I don't, look, Netflix had a dying business. They figured out a way to transition to another similar business. Um, I, wish newspapers were you know, using their, you know, their existing but dwindling circulation to start to build recurring other businesses. Rather than just selling ads, they should be like, you know, we've gone in and, and pitched and we're actually finally going to get a deal done. The Tribeca shortlist, give it away with a subscription. It's a, you know, it's a movie subscription thing. It's $5.99 a month. Just give it to the subscribers of the New York Times or the LA Times or something like that. What a great way to get new people to try a product. Oh, I get something new. And I don't have to pay. It's no different than what T-Mobile does. T-Mobile, I think, is one of the most brilliant mark. They're just a brilliant marketing company. T-Mobile Tuesdays. If you know, a lot of students here, I'm sure, have T-Mobile. They just give you things for free on Tuesdays. Why? Because we like you. And that, has, if you look at the stock of T-Mobile, it has just rocketed because not only do they keep churn down to a minimum. But they also get customer acquisition because people hear about, oh, I'm getting a free pizza, or I get a little this, or that, you know. And, and, it, and so it works. So you, you really have to take those businesses and, and think about how you transition them so you don't, you know, you don't get in trouble. That's, I think that's probably the number one thing. Try to transition before you are in trouble. Last question from the audience. Uh, this is more of like a philosophical question, uh, but it has to do with entertainment in general. Um, I love film and TV as much as the next guy. I was a film media studies minor in college. Um, but the reality is that we are getting like force-fed uh, a lot of content. Everyone is producing it. Uh, there's so much co uh, quality, but then also quantity. Uh, at the same time, you hear about uh, like social, social alienation and things like that. We're completely stuck on our screens. Um, do you have any advice for the younger generations as... Uh, we have this ubiquitous nature of watching any sort of content at any time. Uh, do you have any words on that? Well, I mean, it, it depends on what you're, what you're talking about as far as, you know, I, I think that I would say, you know, we still as an industry battle piracy. Piracy is an issue, and I, and I, I think people, you know, I've talked to a lot of young people that still don't understand that it's not right. You know, and, and so that, that to me is an area that it's this younger generation in 20, 30 years, if you aren't used to paying for content or not paying for content, 
you won't have 350 shows because you just, they, they don't get made for free. So I, I think that that's the key is knowing, you know, where, like sharing a password's one thing, but going and pirating off a BitTorrent site is another thing. You know, there, there's ethics involved in all those dynamics. I'm not saying it's right or wrong on either, any of the, the dynamics. I'm just saying being mindful of that, I think, is important. And I also think the other thing I would say, I see this with my kids, there's other things beyond Netflix. Give other people a show, you know, give other services a chance. Try other shows. Because I see that my kids are, you know, probably spending 60, 70% of their time on Netflix, and that's all they're looking at when there's great content being produced in other areas that, you know, once in a while just back up and say, you know, what other things can I watch to kind of open up my horizon? Maybe I want to watch a, a documentary on Amazon and kind of open up my, you know, my, my thoughts. So I would just say to look around and make sure you don't live too much in one ecosystem. And my closing question is also a social implications one. With all this content out there, do you feel like this contributes to more fragmentation of the pop of pulp our sense of popular culture? Or do you see with all these different distribution channels that there are different kind of subcultures? I think there's more subcultures. I, I think that it, it, it's contributing to more pop culture. I, I think if anything, it's contributing to there's, there's way too much good content that I can't watch. Mm. And everybody, I, I, I'm, I, is there anybody here who thinks they can watch all the stuff they want to watch? No. But there's no shared experience then, because no. Phil's watching one set of things, I'm watching a different set. But of you things. still talk, and they still like when I when I ask uh, my son or my daughter, like, how did you hear about that? From a friend. Mm -hmm. So the social is not maybe the collective viewing together, but I couldn't when I when I would watch something growing up, I couldn't share right after I watched it with all of my friends. Go watch this now. Yeah. That's an empowering piece of technology that. Uh, somebody has and so I, I think that in some ways these subcultures are going to continue and, and really pop culture is going to continue I just think it's going to continue to kind of blossom and explode all right so before I close a few commercial announcements first off if you like this discussion we have another entrepreneurs unplugged coming up November 8th Daniel Epstein and Eric Glustrom who are both social entrepreneurs it'll be fascinating if you like this point about the social implications of technological change, we've got a program just on that with Patty Limerick and others. I think that'll be riveting as well. That's on October 18th. A few other conferences uh, also this fall to keep an eye on. Uh, we also want to say goodbye to Bruno. Where's Bruno? Who is not here. Not here. He's a global entrepreneur in residence. Is he here somewhere? I don't, he maybe left. Anyway, Bruno was here. He's been a great part of our entrepreneur community. Um, if you want to get more involved in entrepreneurship on campus, you heard from Allie and Sarah Beth, um, and we're going to have more global entrepreneurs coming on campus. Finally, we're going to have a reception afterwards. Here's the key thing. For you professionals in the audience, it's your job to go seek out and talk to some of the students. How many students do we have here? Look at that, almost 50-50. They would love to talk to you. They might talk to themselves. Don't let them get away with this. <laughs> <laughs> go talk to them. They've got lots of questions for you. Um, Jim, this was amazing. Thank you so much. You do us proud. Th thank, thank you both very much. Thank you.